You don't need a rifle. You don't need body armor. The government will take care of you and protect you. History tells a different story. History has shown us what happens to disarmed citizens. They eventually fall to the unrestricted freedom that their own government has over them, or they become helpless victims of outside aggressors. Even wild animals are born with the freedom to preserve their own life by any means necessary. But there are very few countries that recognize this right of their own citizens and individuals, and even fewer that protect it. But America is one country that does. Now I know what you're thinking. Many of our rights that were written into the Constitution by our Founding Fathers have already become eroded and even removed in our very young nation. As unfortunate as that is, there's only one group of people that we can blame. Ourself. We, as the citizens and civilians of this nation, the way that it's designed and set up, run the nation. We tell people who go to Washington how to vote. We put those people in power to have our voice. So ultimately, it's our own fault. Now, it's unfortunate that our fellow countrymen who don't value the same things we do uh, are okay going along with gun control laws and the erosion of our rights because what they're ultimately doing is condemning future generations and even, even their own children to not even have the opportunity to choose. If they had their way, their children and our children would never have the choice as to whether or not to be able to defend themselves with modern arms. Now one of the key ways that we can start winning the culture war back again is by normalizing this stuff. Normalizing night vision, body armor, suppressors, all the things that if you've been following us for a while, you have a good understanding of. And the thing is, we can only reach you. We can only reach the people that are gonna be clicking on this video, watching this kind of content. But we can't actually get to the people that you do life with that aren't gonna be watching these videos. So, we enjoy making videos, posting it on YouTube, and normalizing this kind of content, but you have a responsibility as well to take the normalizing efforts of these items to the people that you do life with every day. Now obviously we have a Tavor here. Drew, you've been, uh, you've been running this gun for a little while. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's a very timely gun. Given what everything that's going on in our world today, this is a gun that you're seeing a lot on the news. Uh, this is an Israeli IWI Tavor X95 uh, with a ton of stuff on it. And the reason why we have kitted it out with absolutely everything that we have at our disposal is because we think it's a good time to remind ourselves and you guys just what all we as normal people are capable of uh, and capable of being proficient with. It's very easy to get uh, overwhelmed and angry uh, when we see our rights being taken away or you know, absurd laws being put on the books or non-laws being enforced, but we still have it really good. And if we wanna get it back, like Josh said, let's make this stuff normal, let's show people, and so that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna show you this decked out X95, everything that we put on it, what we do and we don't like about this current setup, uh, what we think about how it shoots, and I'll say this, this rifle we're seeing a lot in the news right now because every Israeli, uh, when they become an adult, has a mandatory military service that they have to fulfill for their country. And the X95 or the, or the Tavor is often, usually, the first rifle that they're issued. Uh, what's interesting is that as much as we think we're like that country, we're not at all the same. Uh, Israeli adults, once they leave military service, can't just go out and buy the gun that they were issued when they were in the IDF. They have to present a need for the rifle. They have to uh, prove to their government that they need it for self-defense. It is not as easy as getting a background check here, which is still a way that we have to get permission from our government to own any of this stuff, which is pretty absurd, but it is what it is. And it's very unsettling to see all of this footage coming out. Almost makes me angry to see all this footage coming out of helpless, unarmed, adult citizens who are just victims of people who want to do bad things to them. Who also, keep in mind, have been given training 
from their government to the point that the government says, yeah, you're good enough, here's a rifle. They have that training, but they still have to prove that there is a reason why they need to have that tool. And this is a common theme with governments. We're not anti-government or anti-terrible governments. Governments are always happy to put a rifle and military arms in your hands when it benefits them. When it doesn't, in other words, wartime. When it doesn't, they like to take it away from you because they want to control you. Unfortunately, we've seen this happen in Ukraine. We've seen this happen in Israel now. And it happens every day all over the world. It just doesn't make headline news. So let's get into the Devor. Let's show you guys what we've done to it, what all you can do as an American citizen. And some of you guys may recognize a gun like this from Call of Duty or from watching movies. This is a bullpup design. It's in the same category as something like an AUG. So the way that it actually works is obviously your trigger pack is still center line in the gun, kind of like what we're used to seeing on an AR-15 or an AK. But then the action and the bolt is behind the trigger pack. So it's actually sitting down here under your face. And when brass comes out of the gun and it chambers a new round, obviously your magazine is back here. What that does for us is number one, it helps with some of the weight. It's getting some of the weight back closer to you and you're not dealing with all this leverage out on the front of the gun. And secondly, is we're getting a 16 inch barrel inside of this platform. Granted, there's a couple inches of suppressor on the front of here as well, but the point is we're saving and conserving a ton of length and trying to get it inside of a small package. So Drew, hold that for just a sec. Yeah. To compare, here is a 16 inch without a suppressor. So if I were to add a suppressor onto there, I'd be dealing with an additional six-ish inches. So you're getting a much more compact gun. That being said, some of your manual of arms have to change as well. And Drew, maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, the manual of arms uh, for all of us AR owners is brutal especially if you don't train on it. Now, I did take a Tavor Operators, uh, operator, not not like, I'm, I have a beard and I have a flannel and I'm a tier one operator. It's literally a, a, a class so that you know how to operate the system better. So there's a couple things. The, the main thing has to, the main difference between this and an AR has to do with how you reload and how you manipulate your charging handle. Um, it's not super intuitive and it is nowhere near as easy as an AR. So, Right off the bat, you'll notice that your safety is very similar to an AR, and your magazine release is an AR style also. It's the same on the opposite side. Safety, magazine release. This right here is your ejection port for your round, so after you shoot, your brass, brass is gonna come out of here, but you can switch this from the left to, or the right, depending on if you're a left or right-handed shooter. <clears throat> but your charging handle uh, is a little bit different. I have an aftermarket one on here. Uh, this obviously comes back to the rear. That's how you charge a, uh, a round into the chamber. It is not recipro reciprocating, so you don't have to worry about this blowing your thumb off whenever you shoot it. Uh, when you eject your mag, let's say, uh, it's, let's say you just shot your last round, the bolt is actually going to stick back like this. So with this to the rear, uh, when you insert your fresh magazine, your thumb will naturally push that up, drop the bolt, and you're good to go. Uh, as far as what to do whenever you have a malfunction, you drop your mag first, you pin this to the rear while pinning this inside your shoulder, canting it slightly to the side so that you can reach your free hand up, get any kind of brass out there, like physically remove whatever the problem is if it doesn't resolve itself. Put a new magazine in, drop the bolt, and you're good to go. Uh, it's definitely a little bit different than uh, an AR and takes a lot of practice and a lot of dry fire to get used to. Um, what did you think about doing that whenever you had to do it for the, I guess the first time? Yeah. It's very much so not the same as picking up an AR and then, you know, after you train with an AR for a little while, you can grab an AK and make it run fairly easy. Granted, you have to rock a mag in, the safety's in a different spot, but all things considered, it feels very comfortable. This, it wasn't uncomfortable, but it, it, I had to change a lot about how I was actually pulling mags out of a chest rig or out of a plate carrier. When you're reloading, you can't see where your magazine is going or you have to look 
down into your armpit. Um, clearing malfunctions was atrocious. It was terrible for me. I would need a lot of time getting comfortable with it. Now, a point that you did make was, if you train with this, and this was the first gun that I actually ran from a young kiddo, yeah, I'd probably learn this thing really well. It's just so different from anything else that I was used to. I felt like I was shooting a gun for the first time. Yeah, same. And even though I haven't shot this in at least a year, it felt the same. So you gotta stay up on it. That's why I definitely recommend if you get one of these and if, you, if, if a bull pup like the X95 fits your needs, please take a class designed for it. IWI offers them. Uh, they have a really great instructor. Their lead instructor is uh, Thomas Alabrando. It's here stateside and uh, it runs you through how to clean, how to maintain, how to change out parts, uh, and of course how to manipulate it. And it, it, it was awesome. And I wish I would have stayed up on those skills. But uh, let's talk about all the weird things we have on here. So this is in no way, let me preface it with this. This is in no way an ideal build. This is just a, we're gonna max out this platform's capabilities. And we are definitely maxing it out right now. It is not, we've optimized it as much as we possibly can, but this thing is heavy as sin and, uh, and is not, the word we're not leaning into its strengths yes exactly we're not leaning into its strengths at all but here's essentially what we've got yep. oh, this thing is brutal drew has a lot more time on this gun than i do and i probably need a significant amount of dry fire now if you guys are looking to get some dry fire equipment check out iTarget pro iTarget Pro is a sponsor of this channel and uh, they have some pretty rad equipment. So they give you caliber specific lasers that go into your gun and when you pull the trigger, a little laser comes out. Helps with dry fire significantly. They have some awesome stuff on their website. Use the discount code DIRTY to save 10%. That's iTargetPro.com, discount code DIRTY. First and foremost, let's talk about optics. So we have a SIG Tango 6T uh, LPVO on this on a zero gravity mount. Did I say that right? Correct. Yeah, awesome. And uh, uh, we also have some 100 Concepts uh, caps on it. Uh, we, we don't have this one on specifically because we have this thermal unit. This is an RH25 that we have on loan from Arcane. They're having an awesome sale on these right now. This is an excellent, somewhat affordable thermal unit that you can clip on to a Picatinny rail or run as a monocular uh, with, with night vision. So we've been experimenting with this a lot. We want to put a thermal unit on it just to see what kind of capability we have out here in you know, the middle of Tennessee and spotting game and even potentially spotting people if we ever had to. Uh, beyond that, I have my CQBL uh, one key G combo here so that I can still use it under night vision. Uh, I can aim passively uh, with the offset Delta Point Pro. And we have a Griffin suppressor. I don't remember the, which one is it. We'll put it up here on the... Yeah, it's, yeah. That's, that's how we do things. Uh, and I also have a Tango Grip right here. Is that the correct name for it, Josh? Sure, yeah. Yeah, Josh corrects me on the names all the time because I just forget. I don't care. I, I like it. I put it on the gun and I shoot it. You'll notice I have a 20 round magazine. That is specifically because I like all of my guns to kind of stay on the same plane. I don't like a magazine sticking further out than the grip itself. Um, it's, not a, uh, it's not an absolute, it's just something I tend to do. Uh, the longer your magazine on bull pups, the more issues you have with, with taking the mag out or stripping the mag in the event of a malfunction. I don't know why we're talking about malfunction so much. This Tavor has actually never malfunctioned unless I purposefully induced it. Uh, but I do like 20 rounders. I keep 30s in my plate carrier and on my belts. Um, on the other side, so what we've got here, uh, we've got a mod light OKW because this is a 16 inch rifle and can reach out quite further than, you know, my 11.5 or even my 10.5. I want a light with the most amount of throw on it. So this high candela mod light OKW is great for that. I do have a push cap. I've been moving towards push caps lately just because uh, I don't want a switch that I have to push. If my thumb is there, then I you know, intentionally move my thumb down and push the switch. Um, beyond that, I, I do have, I failed to mention, 
I do have this mod light, mod button, uh, dual fuel up here, or it's not dual fuel, it's dual lead, because it has two leads that go off of it. And so one goes to the Key G3 IR Illuminator, and the other one goes to the CQBL1, so I, with just one button push, I can turn the laser and illuminator on at the same time, which is pretty nice. Um, there are a couple things that don't immediately catch your attention that I have changed on this. Number one is this cutlass grip. The original X95, if you were just to go out and buy one, has this like big long cutlass. It looks like uh, the, the end of the sword, right? Yeah. Um, I did not like that. I did not like the way that it felt. I wanted something up underneath here. And so uh, again, one of my good buddies, Tom, he sent this to me and I just swapped it out. It's been pretty nice. I also added on a lot of Manticore arms parts um, years ago. They've held up great. Uh, the first one was these uh, aftermarket safety levers. This one is the slim version, so it's nice and slim. And if you are shooting longer ranges, sometimes it's kind of nice to just be able to do this. Uh, so I have a slim one on this side so it doesn't interfere with my hand too much. On this side over here, I have the mid or the thick, so it's easier to snap down, snap back up. Uh, I did replace the stock charging handle with this special one from Manticore. We'll put the name on the screen. It's actually very nice because it stays sleek. The normal one that comes off of it is always out. It'll dig into you, it'll catch on things. And so far I've never had an issue with this, especially like wearing kit. So that's kind of nice and also gives you more leverage when you're trying to pin that bolt back to the rear, which is a huge pain in the butt as, as you'll see in the B-roll. Uh, beyond that, uh, if you're running this suppressed, it does get very gassy, especially with the ports being so close to your face. So Manticore Arms makes an aftermarket uh, gas port cover, and this uh, will certainly probably make your gun way, way more dirty, but you're not having gas blowing directly up into your face, which is pretty awesome. Uh, the last part being this butt, uh, this butt stock uh, replacement. They're usually round, and so you can uh, put on new ones that have this curvature that goes into your shoulder and grips onto it a lot easier. Uh, Tavors, there's not a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, what's it called? Hi, ready? Yeah, dude, I can't think today. I've been sick for two weeks. Um, there's not a lot of high ready going on with Tavors, at least in my experience running this thing, it is a pain to do anything high ready. So having uh, this butt, butt pad on here uh, really makes like low ready a lot easier, just kind of like rolls up into the perfect position. I will say, the lack of rail space is not good on this particular build. Um, if you were running a red dot, it, you wouldn't even necessarily notice. Exactly. Or even if you were running just an LPVO without a thermal, it would be just fine because you could move it a little bit further away from your eye. But the eye relief as it's set up right now is pretty garbage. You have to be very intentional about where you place your head. Um, I think that pretty well covers it. Um, oh yeah. so. Geisley Trigger, thank you. Thank you, Specialist Jones. Uh, this is interesting because the, as far as I'm aware, Geisley does not make the Tavor drop-in trigger pack anymore. And if they do, I can at least say there were several years where you absolutely could not get one. Uh, obviously, the Tavor is not nearly as popular as, as the AR-15, especially here in America. So Geisley, I guess, prioritized making AR parts for you know, the American citizens. Uh, and not so much Tavor parts. So I was lucky enough to get my hands on one of these. Uh, you get a trigger pack and a lightning trigger bow and both of those combined, it's actually two different products, it ends up being about $500, which is a, an expensive trigger it's job. It's a Glock. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it, nothing about this rifle is cheap. Doing anything on it at all is expensive because it's not common. Uh, but the trigger absolutely makes a difference because most bullpups have absolute garbage triggers. This, what did you think? Oh, it's, it's significantly better. It felt I've, I've played with stock bullpup triggers, whether they're AUGs or, or Tavors. And yeah, like Drew said, they're notoriously bad. This trigger feels like a nice Geisley trigger. So in a Tavor. So I would say if you can get your hands on one of those, it's a must. How many ounces of gold is this full rifle build worth? I don't know, but I'm gonna find out. 
post what you think in the comments and uh, we'll pin you, okay? Uh, but if you are looking for gold, you can thank Allegiance Gold for sponsoring this channel and making videos like this possible. Uh, right now, if you go to protectwithdc.com, you can earn up to $5,000 in silver on qualifying purchases. Again, that's protectwithdc.com. Allegiance Gold has an awesome rating compared to all the other gold companies, so check them out. I think that pretty well covers it. Yeah. It's a pretty stellar loadout. There's a time and a place for having a compact gun that still gives you 16 inch uh, barrel length. Obviously you're getting greater distances where your rounds are not going transonic. You're getting better terminal ballistics. Those rounds are gonna be more effective. 5.56 five, as a round is deadly because the round is going fast. When you start shaving down barrel length, obviously you just inherently start to make the gun less deadly. Um, so there is a time and a place for having a compact gun like this. That being said, would you grab this gun in a specific scenario as opposed to an AR? The way it's set up or just the gun in general? The gun itself. I'll always choose an AR. Okay. But that's because I'm trained on an AR far more than I'm trained on this. If this was all I had, I would be happy with it. So this may have felt like a gun review video, but it's actually just a mindset reminder video that we have a lot at our disposal and there's no reason why we shouldn't own it and be proficient with it. And I know when you're probably like us, when you see these images and then you see these videos of people in other countries falling victim to either their own government or to outside actors that wish to do them harm, it's infuriating to us because as Americans, we know that we don't have to be victims if we don't want to be. And it's, it really gets under my skin that more of our countrymen don't understand that and are willing to set themselves up as victims because they don't want to take the time or energy to get even the most basic of the basics in terms of tools and equipment and learn how to use them. Yeah. They don't need all this fancy stuff. You don't need all this fancy stuff, but even the basics, a lot of our own people don't, they don't get it. And it's even more infuriating when the government says that you have to serve inside of the military, be trained with something like this, but then when you go home after you've been trained and handed this over, you don't have the right to own it. So uh, it's pretty terrible when civilians decide that they are going to play the role of victim and ask some other higher power in theory, who's just another human being, to do violent things on their behalf. And it's really bad when the government says, you also do not have that right. And for all of you who are like me, who may have family, a lot of family members who don't believe in this stuff and don't believe the same way that you do, circumstance is the greatest teacher. You can sit here and tell them all the same, all these same things that we're telling you that you already know, and maybe it'll work, maybe it'll sink in, but I find the most effective method is look at history and look at current events and just send them videos and pictures and news stories and let that just sit in their minds. And over time, your words will start to mean more with that in their head.